So good morning, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Popi Sizupiku this morning for our Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, Dr. Sizupiku is a professor of pathology, director of breast pathology, um, and director of the Breast Pathology Fellowship Program at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Sizupiku earned her MD degree in Greece and her PhD degree in immuno immunology from Rush University in Chicago. At Northwestern, Dr. Sizupiku established the first subspecialty breast pathology section in order to support the multidisciplinary breast cancer program, an area of excellence in our institution. In addition, in 2010, she also established a highly competitive breast pathology fellowship program, one of only 15 such programs in the nation. Dr. Sizupiku's subspecialty focuses on breast pathology, breast tumor markers, and molecular diagnostics in breast cancer. Um, please extend a warm welcome to our colleague, Dr. Sizupiku. Good morning, everyone. Many thanks for the invitation to speak at the Grand Rounds today and for the kind introduction. As Dr. Moreira said, my name is Poppy C.Z. Obiku, and I'm the Director of Breast Pathology at Northwestern. So um, as you all know, an accurate and state-of-art pathology evaluation forms the foundation upon which all subsequent therapeutic oncologic decisions are based. So I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss with you today a topic relevant to all oncologists in general and to breast oncologists in particular, how we evaluate breast specimens after neoadjuvant chemotherapy in the pathology laboratory. I'm trying to advance the slide. All right. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that I have no disclosures relevant to today's lecture. And Let's start. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy was initially used in locally advanced cancers in order to convert inoperable tumors to operable. However, it is now increasingly used in earlier stage disease for patients with larger tumors with the goal of shrinking the tumor, avoiding mastectomy, and using breast conserving surgery instead. Similarly, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is used in order to avoid an axillary dissection and convert patients to a sentinel lymph node biopsy instead. In addition to downstaging patients, another very important goal of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the in vivo real-time assessment of tumor response to treatment. It is important to note that through many randomized clinical trials, we now know that the long-term outcome of patients is similar regardless of whether chemotherapy is given before or after surgery. On the other hand, evaluation of the extent of the response is a prognostic factor for individual patients, meaning that those who have a PCR have a significantly better outcome than those without a PCR. Finally, as we all know, the FDA uses response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy as a short-term endpoint in clinical trials to expedite approval of oncology drugs. We uh, now also know that whether or not a patient will achieve PCR also depends on the molecular subtype of the breast tumor and that different breast cancer subtypes have different rates of PCR in the breast and in the lymph nodes. As we can see in this table, higher PCR rates are consistently seen among patients with HER2 positive and triple negative tumors, while hormone positive tumors are relatively chemo resistant, especially those of lobular histology. So what is the role of the pathologist in evaluating the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Well, to start, accurate pathologic evaluation is the gold standard for determining PCR. The role of the pathologist is essential in first, identifying patients who had a PCR. Second, accurately assessing PCR in the breast and in the lymph nodes by careful gross and microscopic evaluation. And third, if no PCR is achieved in evaluating the residual tumor and its biologic characteristics, which will guide further treatment. 
These characteristics may now be different than the original tumor evaluated months ago in the initial middle core biopsy. However, in order for the pathologist to accurately evaluate the response after new adjuvant chemotherapy, he or she first needs to know that this specific patient actually received treatment. So communication between the clinical team and the pathologist is essential. And a quick mentioning of the clinical history on the pathology requisition form, even if you guys say status post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy makes a world of difference in order to assess the specimen accurately the first time around. There are four possible ways that the tumor can respond after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. We can have a complete pathologic response. We can have a partial pathologic response. We can have stable disease, meaning no response, or obviously we can have progression. So in order to put in perspective what happens after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it is important to understand how neoadjuvant chemotherapy affects breast tumors and all tumors for that matter. We will review that in a cartoon form and with histologic pictures from actual pathology specimens. In the best case scenario, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is highly effective. All tumor cells are killed, the entire tumor melts away, and the only thing that is left behind is the tumor bed. So under the microscope, the pathologist now does not see any residual tumor cells at all. Instead, the only evidence of remodeling of the tissue, uh, the only evidence is that of remodeling of the tissue, as we can see in these histologic pictures. Specifically, we see fibrosis and edema, chronic inflammation, foamy histiocytes, hemosiderin deposition, increased vascularity, and stromal microcalcifications, but no residual tumor cells. Now let's discuss what happens if there is no PCR. So different findings are seen, obviously, if there is partial histologic response. In this case, we have some of the tumor cells killed by the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but many are still surviving and are left behind. There are two scenarios on how this can happen. The first scenario is the one that patients think is the one that will happen when they take neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Is that that we call the scenario of concentric shrinkage. That means that the tumor shrinks proportionally and now has more or less the same shape as before, just a smaller size. In the case like this, one can imagine that if we do middle core biopsies concentrating on a smaller area and there is residual tumor, then we will catch it in a few of the middle core biopsies post chemo. In reality, this is a, an unusual scenario. In this unusual scenario, as we can see in this histologic picture, we end up with lots of tumor in a smaller area. In this case, sophisticated breast pathology studies may be able to localize this residual tumor. In contrast, the most common scenario post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that that, res that results in partial response is that of the scattered foci of residual tumor. In, in this scenario, the diameter of the original tumor is more or less maintained in the form of the tumor bed, but many areas of the tumor have melted away, and what remains are scattered foci of tumor cells and smaller and larger nests of tumor cells here and there in the original tumor bed. What we just discussed in a cartoon form is shown here in actual histologic pictures. As you can imagine, it would be very difficult to accurately target the remaining scattered small tumor nests by imaging and middle core biopsies post neoadjuvant chemotherapy in a case like this. This is the reason of the low accuracy of finding residual tumor by using middle core biopsies 
even with the help of sophisticated breast imaging studies in this most common scenario of the remaining scattered residual tumor cells. The pathologic appearance of the residual tumor after neoadjuvant chemotherapy is variable. Sometimes there is no difference in the histologic appearance between the original tumor before therapy and after therapy. However, more often than not, we see reduction in overall cellularity with the tumor breaking up in small nests or individual cells. The cells have larger size, abundant cytoplasm, larger nuclei, multinucleation, pleomorphism, also chronic inflammation and hysteocytic reaction may be seen in the background, calcifications may be present, and occasionally we see stromal retraction around individual tumor cells or nests. Now, how about the appearance of DCIS after neoadjuvant chemotherapy? DCIS foci after neoadjuvant chemotherapy also show histologic changes that are similar to the invasive component, such as larger cell size, abundant cytoplasm, larger nuclei, multinucleation, and pleomorphism. Once again, often we see chronic inflammation and histiocytic reaction in the background. Occasionally, microinvasive foci of tumor are seen around nests of DCIS. Now, let's think about the lymph nodes. What's happening there? The lymph nodes show a number of histologic changes post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In most cases, we see a lymphocytic depletion as the therapy also kills the lymphocytes. We can also see stromal fibrosis and hyalinization without any residual tumor. But if residual tumor is left, the residual tumor may show changes similar to that seen in the breast. Occasionally, the tumor cells are hiding and we need to use keratin immunostain in order to highlight them. For the post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy staging summary, the pathologist needs to state the number of nodes examined and the number of nodes involved by residual tumor, if any. In addition, we need to mention the presence and the extent of extranodal extension. In our institution and many other institutions, a pre-neoadjuvant chemotherapy clip placement helps the pathologist identify the originally targeted lymph node pre-treatment. Isolated tumor cells are defined similar to pre-treatment specimens as deposits of either less than 200 cells or less than 0.2 centimeters in size. As per the AJCC 8th edition, if ITCs are present post neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the node is staged as YPN0I, but that precludes the PCR classification. In contrast to the AJCC, the WHO recommends classifying nodes with ITCs post neoadjuvant chemotherapy as positive without any further uh, characterization. Now, what about the margins? What do we do about that? Well, unfortunately, no clear guidelines exist on how to best evaluate margins post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Full resection of the tumor bed is not necessary. However, if the tumor bed extends to the margins, we should mention that, that should be documented. The standard approach of no ink on tumor cells is favored. Some authors suggest that if there is multifocal involvement with um, multiple scattered foci, we should say that we need more generous margins However, there is no clear definition of how much more that generous margin should be. Other factors such as the tumor biologic subtype, LVI and additional therapy may also play a role. Now, an important question is how to evaluate margins, uh, excuse me, tumor markers after post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Although most tumors 
retain their pretreatment tumor marker profile. A subset displays altered marker profile after treatment. Discordant results are seen for ER up to 15%, for PR up to 30%, and for HER2 up to 10%. Although technical issues occasionally exist, the most likely explanation for these different tumor marker profiles after neoadjuvant chemotherapy is tumor heterogeneity and changes resulting from from treatment, eliminating dominant clones and allowing subclones to manifest themselves. At Northwestern, we repeat the breast tumor markers on all post-treatment specimens as a, marker of pro as a matter of protocol. However, no uniform guidelines exist and policies vary in different institutions. Information about possible histopathologic predictions of the extent of the residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy are obviously urgently needed. A recent paper by Pastorello and collaborators from Dr. Stuart Schmidt's group at the Brigham, which was recently published in Modern Pathology, shed some light in this very interesting question. In this paper, the investigators evaluated 665 patients treated by neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by lumpectomy for 278 of them and by mastectomy for the remaining 387 cases. PCR was seen in 177 patients, just over a quarter of these patients. Of interest, there was big difference in the incidence of PCR based on the tumor subtype. Only about 8% of the hormone positive patients achieved PCR, while almost 40% of the HER2 positive and the triple negative patients did so. After excluding patients for whom only DCIS was present or only LVI was found, or for whom no information was available, the investigators were able to evaluate 389 patients with residual disease post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Of those, 143 had a lumpectomy and 246 had a mastectomy. Of interest relevant to today's discussion, about a quarter, 26% of these patients showed concentric shrinkage and the remaining three-fourths of the patients showed the scattered foci pattern of tumor regression. In univariate and multivariate analysis, the investigators found that the scattered foci pattern of residual disease was associated with larger tumor size, with positive lymph nodes, with lower tumor grades, grade one and two versus three, and with specific breast cancer subtypes. The scattered foci pattern was seen in 86% of the hormone positive tumors, but only in 47% of hormone negative tumors. When the tumors were stratified by both the hormone receptor and the HER2 status, the scattered foci pattern was seen in almost 90% of the hormone positive HER2 negative tumors but only in 45% of the triple negative tumors, and that difference was highly statistically significant. This study is raising the interesting possibility that histopathologic parameters may predict the pattern of residual disease in at least some subset of breast patients treated by neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, in the last 25 years or so, a number of classification systems have been proposed for, the, for evaluating response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. As you can see in this table, they vary in their definition of what consist, constitutes complete response, with some systems evaluating the breast only, but most of the systems evaluating response both in the breast as well as in the lymph nodes. In addition, the, these different systems vary in the weight they give to the presence of DCIS. For most, the presence of DCIS only 
after neoadjuvant chemotherapy qualifies as a complete response. Finally, some systems require direct comparison of the pre- and post-treatment specimens, but most do not. So now for the remaining of today's discussion, I will focus only on the most widely used systems, the residual cancer burden system and the new eighth edition of the AJCC system. The residual cancer burden system was developed by Siemens and colleagues at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. The pathologic parameters required to calculate residual tumor burden post neoadjuvant chemotherapy are the tumor bed dimensions, the overall residual tumor cellularity as a percentage of the area, the percentage of residual tumor that is DCIS, the number of positive lymph nodes, and if the lymph nodes are positive, the diameter of the largest metastatic focus in the lymph nodes. These pathologic parameters are then incorporated into a free online calculator available on the MD Anderson website that defines four categories of response to treatment. The algorithm generated RCB score and the RCB class correlate with patient outcomes, specifically with disease-free survival in all molecular subgroups, as you can see in this table, from the author's 2017 JCO publication and as it was presented in their multi-center pooled analysis at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in 2019. Moving on to the AJCC 8th edition, uh, that edition uh, update also provided guidance on how to evaluate breast specimens post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In the guidelines, PCR is defined either as the absence of tumor in the breast or the presence of residual DCIS only. The presence of any carcinoma, either in the breast or in the lymph nodes, precludes the PCR classification, and that includes the presence of microinvasion and LVI in the breast or um, ITCs in the lymph nodes. In contrast to the AJCC 7th edition, only the largest continuous focus of residual tumor is used for the determination of the YPT and the YPN stage. Intervening foci of treatment related changes or necrosis, according to these guidelines, should not be included in those measurements. We use the M modifier to signify the presence of multiple foci of residual carcinoma. And in the uncommon scenario that only LVI is present, then the guidelines recommend to use the prefix YPTX with a kind of note, some kind of a note explaining the situation. Now of note, if a patient is diagnosed with inflammatory carcinoma, this patient remains classified as T4 regardless of the response to chemotherapy. And furthermore, if a patient is diagnosed with distant METs, the patient remains classified as M1 regardless of the response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Now, the evaluation of specimens after neoadjuvant chemotherapy presents unique challenges and is different than the evaluation of specimens from patients that are not treated in such a way. The pathologic parameters required in the post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy pathology report are as follows. We need to mention the dimensions of the tumor bed, the presence of residual tumor and the size, the residual tumor cellularity, the presence or absence of residual DCIS. Do we have any LVI? So we need to mention that. What's going on with the lymph nodes, number of positive nodes, and if they're positive, what is the diameter of the largest metastatic focus? Do we have any treatment effect? what's going on with the margins, and any information on the re-evaluation of breast tumor markers. 
Finally, in this era of de-escalation of surgical treatment, a number of studies tried to address the, the issue of the use of image-guided biopsies instead of surgery for evaluation of response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. In this table, we see a number of retrospective studies. These investigators reported in last year's San Antonio an unacceptable false negative rate when we do that between 5 and 49%. Of interest, uh, Tasulis and collaborators reported that their unacceptable 18.7% uh, false negative rate was cut down to 3.2% if the residual tumor after neoadjuvant chemotherapy was smaller than two centimeters and if the investigators used vacuum assisted biopsies of more than six cores. During the same session in last year's San Antonio, three other groups reported results of their prospective studies addressing the same issue. Can we avoid surgery post neoadjuvant chemotherapy if we use sophisticated imaging techniques and image guided biopsies to evaluate the area of the possible residual tumor? Unfortunately, the conclusion, sorry. Um, I had to advance this, <laughs> it didn't, didn't go. Unfortunately, uh, the conclusion of these three very well-defined design studies was no. In the first study, Hale and collaborators reported a 17.8% false negative rate in a study involving 21 German centers. In the second study, Basic and collaborators reported a 22.5% false negative rate from the Energy RB005 study. And in the last one, Peters and collaborators reported an even higher 37% false negative rate based on the results of the Dutch MICRA study. These results suggest that at least for now, surgical excision after, uh, of the tumor after neoadjuvant chemotherapy continues to be the preferred practice. So in summary, our take home uh, messages today are as follows. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is used more and more often in clinical practice and is becoming the standard of care in subsets of breast cancer patients. Detailed pathologic evaluation of the tumor response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy in surgical specimens still remains the gold standard. Evaluation of specimens after neoadjuvant chemotherapy poses unique challenges and is different than the evaluation of specimens from patients not treated in such a manner, which stresses the importance of communication between the clinical team and the pathologist for optimal patient care. Accurate assessment of response after treatment and appropriate reporting of pathologic findings has major therapeutic implications for management and, prognostic, uh, uh, and the prognosis of the patients. Underestimation of the residual disease post neoadjuvant chemotherapy leads to underdiagnosis and omission of uh, possible beneficial additional adjuvant treatments. Pathologic features of the tumor pre treatment, such as tumor size, tumor grade, and the biologic subtype of the tumor are associated with specific patterns of residual disease post neoadjuvant chemotherapy when no PCR is achieved. And finally, pathologists play a critical role in standardizing classification systems, post neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and optimizing the knowledge gained by this approach to breast cancer therapy. So this will conclude the, our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Sizio Piku. Uh, just wanted to see if there was any questions from the audience as, as we move forward. Really appreciate that very informative talk. I can ask my question directly. Uh, is that okay, Jonathan? Of course.
So Popey, you know, one of the things we face, and there's not a lot of data uh, in patients where you do have residual disease and the markers do change, you know, for instance, in the HER2 positive space and they go HER2 positive to negative, uh, you know, the dilemma is, do you continue with the HER2 therapy? And we have some data suggesting that HER2 negative after pre-op do, um, you know, do benefit from continuing the therapy. We tend to do that. But can you comment more on the heterogeneity that we're seeing in tumors and how we should address that as clinicians? Sure. Um, the, uh, your question is twofold. Um, I can talk a little bit about heterogeneity. So uh, heterogeneity exists in all tumors. Uh, I think we um, kid ourselves if we think that tumors are 100% consistent in their tumor marker expression. And what neoadjuvant chemotherapy does is actually unmask these um, differences. Um, when we treat with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, obviously we are after the major clone. Most of the times we manage to uh, put this clone under control, but that gives the opportunity to the lesser clones to actually manifest themselves. And that's the situation that then results in the 15% discrepancy, 30% discrepancy that I mentioned earlier. Now, how to deal with this <laughs> seems to be more along your lines of expertise than mine. Um, I don't think clear guidelines exist. Um, in some institutions, as I mentioned earlier, they do not repeat the markers after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, specifically to, uh, since the, there is no clear guidelines on what to do with information. At our own institution, I think you guys wanted this information to be available, so then you can make a more informed um, choice and um, decision on how to address the patients. So I don't think we have clear guidance at this point, um, yet this is useful information to have for every patient. Thank you. Is there any, um, uh, you know, a lot of centers uh, report RCB score after uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Is that uh, something that is um, uh, promoted or supported or suggested by the ACP as something we should be doing uniformly, or is it still an open question about the clinical utility of that? Um, there are no formal guidelines. However, uh, at Northwestern, as you probably have seen in our reports, as of a few months ago, we arrived at the decision to include this information. Uh, in the past, we um, had discussions with our clinicians, and our clinician told us that they wanted to calculate these, these markers, not markers, but the, the scores themselves, occasionally together with a patient sitting in front of the computer and sort of like having a discussion. But um, uh, recently it was felt that when this information becomes part of the pathology report is more formal and more uh, standardized. So we decided to include it here at Northwestern. Many other major centers do as well, but there is no formal guidance. CAP doesn't have any recommendations about including it or not including it. So I guess it's um, at the discretion of the individual center. Hopefully you find it useful, Bill, when you see it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think what I um, mentioned during the talk, and I'll probably conclude with that same thought as well, communication is the key. We never do something in the pathology laboratory without consulting with our clinician colleagues first. The only things we need to include are things that are useful to them and our patients. And it's a two-way street. There is always communication, especially to address this very difficult and state of art issues for which no clear guidelines exist at the moment. So we are very fortunate to practice in an environment where um, this communication is an everyday occurrence. Any other questions from any audience members this morning? Okay. Maybe I can ask a question. Yes, of course. You know, there's, there's increasing interest in neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy for different tumors, including like pancreatic tumors. 
Do you know if the ACB has standardized evaluation of uh, post-treatment uh, tumors in different areas like pancreatic and other cancers, just the way you have done for your breast cancers? Um, I'm sure there is lots of discussion on what is the optimum, um, the, the optimal parameters that need to be included in the pathology report for many other subtypes. Um, I'm sure the GI group is also standardizing their pathology reports for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in pancreatic or any other GI cancers. Um, the specific um, parameters that need to be included, um, I guess, are, gu are guided by the information that would be useful to our clinicians. Um, I'm not sure if they have standardized their reports yet, but I can tell you that obviously every subspecialty is working in having this standardized reports. In breast, obviously we have them standardized for many years now and different groups of different disease types um, are working towards that goal as we speak. Thank you. Sure. Well, Dr. Siziopiko, it's uh, been an absolute pleasure to meet you and thank you so much for that very informative talk this morning. Um, it was a pleasure to welcome you. We look forward to other opportunities to have you speak at our Grand Rounds in the future. Thank you very much, Thanks, Jonathan. Poppy. Thanks, Poppy. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. You're so welcome. Take care. Bye-bye.